Thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures, a continuing series of lectures of anthropological studies. Today's lecture is lecture number 25, and the title is, Are We Puppets of the Ego? My host today, Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. How are you, Jim? Fine, thank you, Rick. Thank you for inviting me to be here again. And the, as you said, you know, the title of our lectures today is Are We All, or Most of Us, Puppets of the Ego? That's an extremely important lecture because um, it's a matter, you know, that is being discussed in a very limited manner. It means we haven't gone deeper into it, deeper enough to understand the ego properly. You know, uh, we had past lectures where we described the history of planet Earth and the history of the human race. There we explained that the original humanities that lived on Earth had no ego. We, we disagree completely from Darwin's theory of evolution and his followers that we have descended from the cave people that also descended from gorillas and primates, you know, monkeys. So our original ancestors were supermen, superwomen. You know, people who were much higher than what we are today. We could say they were angelical beings and they lost their status, their stage of perfection when they didn't obey to cosmic law, you see? And this is extremely important to be comprehended. Uh, this is why if we need to say it over and over again, we will continue doing it. There is a strong discussion that has been happening through the years about ego and alter ego. You know, psychologists and psychiatrists, they continue defending the ego. Today, there is no much discussion about ego and, and alter ego, but people defend the ego a lot because they say it's part of nature, which is true. It is part of nature. It is part of our inferior nature. But for those who understand the purpose of life, there is a true purpose of life. Now, do we have to obey? Do we have to follow that true purpose of life? Well, the divinity, the creator of the universe that lives within each one of us, it's not a dictatorship. We have free will. But when we have twisted ourselves so much to the extreme of becoming, you know, evil, we can say that, negative, destructive, and self-destructive, there is a limit for that. And we have touched the limit. Today, we are at the end of a cycle and the beginning of a new cycle. Allow me to explain this. According to the confrontation or the, you know, perception of ego and alter ego, what's a alter ego? Alter ego is a superior ego. And the inferior ego is what we call, you know, ego. But Gnostic anthropology, our school of Gnostic anthropology, which is the new anthropology, the new study of man, a more revolutionary perception of reality, and also Gnostic psychology, Gnostic cosmology, we disagree completely with that perception that there is an ego and an alter ego. We say ego is ego. There is no superior ego. There is no such inferior ego. There is nothing great about the ego. At the contrary, why? Why? Because the ego is always subconscious, unconscious, infraconscious, which is lower than consciousness. So what's beautiful about being lower than being conscious? Of course not. We make mistake after mistake. And this is why the world today is upside down, isn't it? As it has been before in human history. Many ups and downs because the ego is always there, creating trouble after trouble. The ego is not our essence. We had a lecture before, if I don't, if I remember well, lecture number eight in our series of lectures, 
the ego is not our essence. The ego is not our real being. The ego is not who am I, who I am, because we have many eyes. The ego is many, many eyes. You know, this is why we have so many contradictions within ourselves. You see, and the ego is not God within. It is not. Now, to understand this concept better, you know, Rudolf Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, who was a member of the Theosophical Society, and apparently he developed his own school of thought later, he referred to, you know, that this conception of supporting the ego is based on believing that there is an inferior nature and a superior nature. So if we eliminate the inferior nature, of course, we will ascend into understanding better our superior nature. And this is why they develop these concepts of ego and alter ego. But Rudolf Steiner clarifies something, you know, in a better manner, when he says there are people that are totally convinced that evolution is the law, is the cosmic law that will allow us to ascend into a better stage of consciousness. Even some people speak about conscious evolution, convinced that through evolution we are all going to become supermen, superwomen. But the trouble is that when Darwin supported this idea also, Mr. Louis Pasteur, another scientist, disagreed with Darwin because he said that Darwin ignored the opposite law of evolution, which is the law of involution. And because the straight line doesn't exist, everything is a curve, time is rounded. So there is an ascension, evolution is an ascension, and the other half of the wheel is a descension, the law of involution, the law of degeneration, you see, opposite to generation. And this is why all these concepts about understanding the possibility of ascension through evolution into higher levels of consciousness is, is being proven wrong. You know, this is also based in an ancient concept of the ancient Egyptians that developed a magnificent civilization. We all know about that. The ancient Egyptians spoke about the will of samsara. The will of samsara is exactly the same law of evolution and the law of involution, ups and downs, ups and downs. So this is why those who only believe in, in evolution without involution have been proven incomplete and wrong. And this is Mr. Darwin and his followers. But people who practice esoteric knowledge, which is not, you know, Gnostic, Gnostic anthropolo anthropological studies, they continue believing that through evolution we are all going to become better and better and ignoring that we've been evolving for millions of years, and look at the result. You see, so this is why uh, Rudolf Steiner completed his analysis, saying that, understanding that we cannot reach a high stage of consciousness through evolution, he said that the founders of the Theosophical Society described also that in the future they would be given to humanity a second step, to learn to ascend into masterhood. And now, respectfully, we have reached that second stage of knowledge through Gnostic anthropology. Respectfully, we say that the Theosophical Society a hundred years ago did a good work, but today, a hundred years later, Gnostic anthropology is carrying the torch of enlightenment to humanity, bringing the second stage of knowledge to ascend into masterhood. And now, through Samael Onveor, the founder of Gnostic anthropology, an archangel reincarnated on earth, we will be able to ascend into a higher stage of consciousness or masterhood through a tremendous revolution of our consciousness. 
revolution of our soul, because evolution is not enough to ascend. Ups and downs, ups and downs won't take us to a higher level. But getting out of the wheel of samsara is the way. It is the way. Now, coming back into the history of the human race, scientists are trying, have been trying to prove that we descended from monkeys, from gorillas, and, you know, saying, yeah, they do have 48 chromosomes, monkeys and gorillas, and we have 46. So it means that we descended from monkeys and gorillas. Why did we explain the same situation from a total different angle? You know, in our lecture, History of Planet Earth and History of the Human Race, we explain, you know, the same situation, evolution, involution, evolution, involution. Because involution is not only, is not always bad. Involution means also devolution, returning to the original point. When we, as a humanity, were planted in our planet Earth, and at the end of all cycles of evolution, involution, we will return to the absolute the homeland of the spirit, where we descended millions and millions of years ago. And we were planted here on earth, spiritually speaking, and we were provided by the vehicles to move within our planet earth and within the universe. So what happened is that now our planet earth will be returning to the absolute, will be diminishing its size. It means the physical aspect of planet Earth will be transformed into an etheric, state, etheric stage, which is more, you know, more uh, coming back into an electronic stage because the ether is the fourth dimension. So at the end of our cellular, you know, round, the entire planet Earth won't be cellular anymore. It will become etheric. So this is why when monkeys and gorillas have 48 chromosomes and we only have 46 chromosomes which are physical, connected with our cells, well, there are two more chromosomes which are etheric, less dense. So our matter is becoming less dense than the monkeys and gorillas. What are we trying to explain here? is that monkeys and gorillas used to be humans like you and me, who is listening to this lecture. Monkeys and gorillas descended from the cave people. They were degenerated human beings who mixed with animals sexually, and the result were monkeys and gorillas. Do you know, do you know that it's been already proven in Africa and in some Latin American countries Couples like you and me, men and, and women, had babies that were monkeys or animals similar to monkeys. It has never been proven the other way around, which is never ever a couple monkeys had a baby that was human. Okay, let's try to understand that. Maybe we don't like what we are saying, but reality is reality. And we have to kneel down before reality. So monkeys and gorillas, you know, used to be people that entered into a stage of deep degeneration. Why? Because of the ego. The ego is animal psychology. And when the animal psychology commands our lives, we will become progressively more and more animalis animalistic. You see, and this is very important to be comprehended. This is why the importance of learning to annihilate the ego we don't need the ego to survive, as many people are convinced of it. The ego has to be annihilated. And this is something also very important. Even Mother Nature annihilates the ego. There are two ways to annihilate the ego. Consciously here, and in our lecture about meditation, we explain that. You know, how can we annihilate the ego consciously? Through meditation of the annihilation of the ego. And this, the second way to annihilate the ego is after we die, in the infra-dimensions of nature, the mineral kingdom immersed, 
called also Inferno, we experience the second death. Because Mother Nature, with the fire of the Holy Spirit, downstairs will burn those demons that constitute the ego. Those legions of demons will be annihilated there. And then after the ego dies completely, after the second death has been experienced in the most horrible suffering. The Bible explains about this, the second death. So it's very important to comprehend that if the ego doesn't die here, consciously, here and now, on purpose, Mother Nature will do the work downstairs at the end of the cycle. And today, right now, we are experiencing the end of the cycle. You see, we can see it. Mother Nature is recycling planet Earth through, you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, all kind of global catastrophes. It means that process of recycling is teaching us that this is the end of the cycle. And if we don't recycle ourselves, you know, we are going to be wiped out from the face of the earth. And our souls will descend into the abyss, into the infra dimensions, mineral kingdom immersed, or inferno. Many people I have been discussing with many esoteric groups, you know, people who are convinced that other religions never describe inferno. And respectfully, allow me to disagree, because all religions describe the inferno. For example, you know, the ancient, the ancient Aztecs and Mayans, they spoke about the Mictlan of the Nahuatl. What is that? That's the inferno of the ancient Aztecs and Mayans. The Hindu religion speak about the Avicii. The ancient Egyptians speak about the Amenti. The Greeks, they call it the Hades, the Hades. Well, you can see it. It's there, but we have to do the work. We have to really immerse within going deeper and deeper into, you know, this kind of studies. This is why Gnostic anthropology is again the torch that is bringing the world what has been missing for many, many generations. And here we are. Now, you know, in our lecture number eight, when we spoke about essence, ego, and personality, the seven deadly sins, you know, have to be annihilated. They have to be transformed into the seven virtues. This is doing the work consciously here through a tremendous revolution of the soul, a tremendous revolution of consciousness, learning to transform lust into, you know, scientific chastity. Don't confuse chastity with celibacy. You know, Jesus Christ, who developed the seven deadly sins, never, never spoke about celibacy. You know, and, and also when he was questioned, are you coming to deny the law and the prophets? The answer was, no, I'm coming to fulfill them. I do agree with all prophets. I do agree with Moses and all ancient prophets that came before. So scientific chastity means learning to make love with love, conscious love, conscious chastity, in opposite to the animal you know, manifestation of sexuality, which is purely lusty. You know, this is why there are so many children that come to the world who are not wanted. And then we have children that grow up with only one parent. And these children, of course, when you grow up without love, without being loved, without being wanted, you develop a lot of negativity in your own life, bitterness. Suddenly, most of people like that end hating themselves and hating the world. And this is pure ego. Because they are children of egotistic sexual encounters. They were never planned. When we practice scientific chastity, you plan to have children who are loved before they come. Or if you don't want to have children, you also plan your sexual life. But we will explain that later, you know, in a proper lecture about this. So we could say a second deadly sin is anger. Anger. 
You know, I've been discussing with many psychiatrists and psychologists who are totally convinced that anger is a natural, you know, emotion. And they say, oh, we need, we need anger. We need it because, you know, if we don't explode with anger, nobody will listen to us, you know. It's a, it's a natural reaction to wrong behavior from other people. Well, we have to agree that it is a natural emotion, of course, but it is an inferior emotion. It's a negative emotion. It's an egotistic emotion. Now, what about an emotion coming from our soul, from our consciousness? A positive emotion opposite to anger. What about serenity and patience? You know, even if it is the end of the world, you never get angry. Do you know that anger is coming from fear? Fear. Fear of losing a battle. You see, you react with anger because you don't want to lose, you want to win. And then sometimes you try to scare people when you have maybe more muscles or maybe more weapons on your side than the opposite, than the opponent. The problem is, you know, when we learn to be serene and patient, of course, we, th we can think better, we can react in a more intelligent manner. Because, you know, as I said, as we said it before, the ego creates only enemies. So last, children that are not wanted, they become enemies of society. Not all of them, but many of them. And hating their lives, hating the world, hating humanity. So anger is also based on fear. When anger is not annihilated, listen to this, it becomes hatred. Because it grows and grows and grows. The ego gets stronger and stronger and stronger. You know, that criminal individual who recently assassinated 77 people in Norway and he has shown no remorse. He'd been convinced that he's an angel of death and everybody were a demon. So he eliminated bad people. He's totally convinced of that. In a country where democracy is a must, a beautiful country, very much democratic, where social conflicts have been almost eliminated, a country, you know, where people live a very serene life. But this individual with a neo-Nazi psychology acted in, in such a way because he disagreed with the political point of view of people who were supporting their own philosophical perception of reality and their own political perception of reality, which is a social democratic regime. And this individual killed a lot of younger individuals that were concentrated in a camp and without mercy, not only he shot them all, but he executed them, shooting them after with another small weapon in their heads to make sure that they were going to be dead. Well, this individual transformed his anger into hatred. When you learn to hate, you know, you become a monster. How many people hate today, you know, who have never been able to annihilate their anger? So we could say they became puppets of their own ego. They are all many, many eyes, many little monsters that we all carry within. Same thing with lust. Our monsters, our animal psychology pushed us into having sex without any respect for life. You know, because sex should be a divine practice. You know, isn't it, isn't it life? something that deserves respect. So anger. Now, what about number three? Arrogance. Arrogance. When people are in a position of power, they enjoy humiliating others. That makes them feel more powerful, you know, superior. And they convince themselves that God gave them that position of power. But you know, through history, we have seen how many empires have collapsed arrogant individual, they were ruling countries and sometimes like the Roman Empire, they were ruling continents. What are they now? You see, they disappeared. They created only enemies. So what is the solution to eliminate, to annihilate the ego of arrogance? 
the opposite, which is a positive emotion, being able to learn to become humble. Samael Anveur, the founder of Gnostic Anthropology, has said, the only way to reach wisdom is by learning to be humble. And after we reach wisdom, we have to be more humble than before. You see, the way children are, children are very humble when they are learning to talk and they are bombarding grown-up people with questions. They are hungry and thirsty for knowledge. This is the magic moment that we all had. And what happened? It happened that when our questions were not answered and that we were told to go to play with other children, then we convinced ourselves that it wasn't good anymore to continue questioning our grown-up people because we were not important and they preferred to ignore us instead of helping us to understand the world, to understand life. Probably because they didn't even know themselves to understand life, to comprehend the world. You see, so at the very end, we fell in love with mediocrity. When we fall in love with mediocrity, do you know what happens? We become followers. We develop the psychology of slaves. You know, when people go to the military and you are just a simple soldier and the sergeant or people who are in a position of power within the military and they call you a stupid, are you a stupid? And you say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I'm telling you that this not only happens within the military, it happens everywhere. When people are being ruled by a society, a very unjust society. And I'm talking about all societies in our actual planet Earth because they are all egotistic. When we develop the psychology of slaves, we tolerate abuse. And of course, abuse will develop more and more and more. And this is why there is a moment that people don't tolerate you know, after centuries of suffering, people don't tolerate, you know, that abuse any longer. And then we have bloody revolution, but this is not only also a solution. It's not also a solution. The Roman Empire caused the death of millions of people. You see, the confrontation, wars, have only pain and suffering, horror, increasing, you know, the ego, increasing anger, increasing hatred. And this is why, you know, arrogance doesn't pay. The ego doesn't pay. But learning to be humble, it really pays because it's truly an intelligent conduct, con a truly intelligent behavior, human behavior, away from animal psychology of being arrogant, selfish. What about number four, envy? You know, when, when we see people that are more successful than we are, we also don't like them. We speak against them. We hate them deeply inside. We are envious of the success of others. Why shouldn't we learn to be content? Because we can learn from them. You know, if they are more successful than we are, they might be doing something right and we might be doing something wrong. So when we are envious, aren't we also puppets? of those demons that rule our lives. What about number five, greed, greed, instead of generosity? We could say that the ego is an illness of the soul. Here we disagree with psychologists and psychiatrists. The ego is an illness of the soul. It wasn't given to us by the divinity. We created our own ego because we had free will. So God gave us a blueprint to become humans. But we are not humans. We are only intellectual animals. So we have to annihilate the animal part to become true humans, 100% humans. And this is why, you know, we created the ego. So we shouldn't then respect the ego as a gift from heaven because it's not a gift from heaven. It's actually the opposite. It's a gift from hell because the ego belongs in inferno. And this is why Mother Nature Annihilate the ego in inferno because the divinity created the inferno, of course, the infra dimensions and the mineral kingdom immersed to help us because the divinity knew ahead of time that we, that we would fall into this 
mistakes, ignoring cosmic law, divine laws, to ascend into the divinity, to come back to God, because we have walked away from God. So instead of greed, shouldn't it be generosity? When people make, we have said it before, when people make, you know, $10 million, well, they would love to make, to increase that amount to $100 million. And after you reach that level, wouldn't you enjoy trying to get $1 billion, you know? And after $1 billion, many billions. If you do it to really improve human life on Earth, it would be okay, because in reality, money, money is not evil. It depends on what we do with the money. If we use it for a wrong purpose, like creating wars, creating pain, suffering on earth, it is evil, really. And if we use it to exploit people, to enslave people, of course, it is wrong. Instead of being generous, we don't need to have any money to be generous. Sometimes you just can support yourself, but can, can you spend some time on weekends visiting hospitals, helping people who are suffering more than you do, and then bringing some hope into people who are really suffering more than we do. This is generosity, because ego is me, 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 instead of our psychology that should become we are all important, not only me. What about number six, laziness, instead of being industrious, instead of being industrious. You see, laziness has many causes. One, it could be that our, our health is not in good shape, so then we, don't, we cannot function properly, we cannot work. But in most of cases, people prefer to have a, an easy life living from criminal activities, you know, taking from other people, abusing other people at the minim, minimum effort, you see. And of course, laziness is also one of the seven deadly sins instead of being in Duchess. Here we can see also that the ego is our boss instead of learning to annihilate it. So being in Duchess means that you have discovered the purpose of life. We are here to ascend, not to descend. And the ego has made us to descend. Laziness is bringing us down into inferno, into the infra dimensions of nature. Learning to be industrious is the opposite. But industrious in a positive manner also is not a workaholic who only cares about himself, me, 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 me. Being industrious means also becoming a good example, a role model for others, to help other people also to stop being lazy and to fall in love with life, to fall in love with what you do. Because we all have a vocation in life. We all have so many talents. Well, let's develop those talents and let's enjoy what we do, you see? So then we can stop being puppets of our ego. What about gluttony, number seven? Instead of moderation, you know, gluttony is eating and drinking in excess. We can always get very ill if we eat and drink in excess. And of course, it becomes a vice and sometimes we cannot stop doing it. We are... You know, we are depressed, and this is a good excuse to feel better. Because in reality, you know, we are eating something that we enjoy or drinking something that we like, and when you are in a stage of being drunk, you feel happy for a while, even if the next morning you are vomiting your soul and you feel miserable, you know, with a strong headache. So essentially, you know, moderation is the answer. When we practice moderation, we are ascending. We are developing willpower. We are not like most of people, you know. We are the stronger individuals. This is part of the revolution of the soul consciousness, higher than the law of evolution. So the ego in reality has been created when we ignore the first book of the Bible. You know, the first book of the Bible, the Genesis, there it, it, it describes the two trees that are within ourselves and also within the universe. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the second tree is the tree of life. We cannot touch the tree of life without eating first from, from the fruits of knowledge of good and evil. 
The trouble today in our modern world is that pseudo-esoteric groups are teaching the world that there is nothing wrong. So they have ignored, they are ignoring the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They are convinced that there is nothing is wrong. And do you know why? Because they know if we don't annihilate the ego here, Mother Nature will do it downstairs through the second death. It doesn't matter if we commit all kinds of atrocities here. Well, Mother Nature will collect from us after we die. And they believe this is okay. Oh, they are so intelligent. They are so smart, you know. We don't need to do anything good because at the end, you know, who cares? Nothing is wrong. Everything is a lesson. And this is very sad, you know, because there is a law of cause and effect. Instead of creating paradise on earth, we prefer to create inferno, to make inferno ascend from the inferior dimensions of space and time to ascend onto the surface of the earth. And this is what wars are all about. I've been in a war myself, so I know it is pure hell, pure inferno. There is nothing beautiful about any war. And the trouble is we have ended glorifying war instead of glorifying peace. You see the point? So these pseudo-esoteric groups are teaching the world the wrong teachings, ignoring the sacred book called the Bible, not only the, the Bible, all sacred books teach the same principles, the doctrine of the divine doctrines of God to humanity, to teach us to ascend, because the tree of knowledge of good and evil is also alchemy, learning to transform lead into gold, but it's not only physical lead and physical gold. I'm talking about psychological lead and psychological gold. Psychological gold is the spirit. How can, how can we ascend from matter into a spirit? How can we spiritualize matter to make it one with the spirit? So we can amalgamate both matter and spirit, but a matter transformed and matter is not only our physical body, matter is also our thoughts, our emotions, you see? And this is something very important to be comprehended. So we are ignoring the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this is completely wrong. This is, you know, unfortunately, the doctrine of the Black Lodge. We, the members of the schools of Gnostic anthropology, are disciples of the White Lodge, ruled by Jesus Christ and all prophets. Moses, an amazing prophet from the past who has been ignored. He will remember that, you know, Moses wrote in the Bible the struggle between King David and Goliath. Do you remember that? King David confronted Goliath and his legion of demons. Goliath is the ego of the Jewish religion. And King David defeated Goliath by, you know, annihilating this chief of legion of demons and decapitated him after that. It means that he got rid of him forever. And all the other demons ran away. So King David is connected with the Jewish religion. And this is extremely important because there is a, a, a perfect connection with Jesus Christ teaching about annihilating the seven deadly sins. The Ten Commandments on Moses are very well connected with the seven deadly sins. How can we learn to ascend into masterhood? Into masterhood. You see? And this is extremely important. So I, I have witnessed myself, allow me to say this, I have witnessed myself that I've been invited to meetings of people who call themselves very spiritual. And I have seen when the leaders of that group, men and women, are invoking the ego, treating the ego as a superior being, a superior force, ignoring that the ego is the same Satan of all religions. So these groups, pseudo-esoteric groups, working for the Black Lodge, they have rendered cold. They rendered cold to the ego, ignoring that the ego is the apocalyptic beast of the Bible, which is a habitant of hell, 
a habitant of the inferno. Have you ever seen your own ego? Well, I have seen it, and I'm telling you, it's a very horrible monster with the appearance of a huge gorilla with a crocodile tail. This is why all egos have a reptilian form, a gigantic reptilian form. And those people who are talking about the reptilian people, they ignore that we, we all who have the ego within and allow the ego to get stronger and stronger by invoking it, rendering call to the ego and making this reptilian monster to grow and grow and grow. And at the end, we become slaves of Satan, slaves of the ego, slaves, you know, of a habitant of inferno. And where are we really leading our lives? Aren't we puppets of the ego at that specific moment? Remember that, you know, this is the end of a cycle. The same that happened in the past. The Bible speaks about Sodoma and Gomorrah, when the Adams and the Eves were punished. God doesn't punish, you know. Cosmic law punished the Adams and the Eves who disobeyed cosmic law. They disobeyed what we said before, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They also convinced themselves that nothing is wrong, everything is okay. And of course, when they disobeyed this divine lesson from heaven, they collapsed. They lost their stage of perfection. They lost their angelical stage. And they experienced a global catastrophe. So they used to live in what today is the Pacific Ocean. And the Pacific Ocean didn't exist at that time. So that continent, the Lemurian continent, collapsed in the middle of earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. And the water purified after that huge global catastrophe that lasted more than a thousand years. Purified water covered what today is the Pacific Ocean. You see, now what about another global catastrophe because of the same cause? The Bible speaks about the flood that was the collapse of another huge civilization called Atlantis, described by Plato you know, that Greek philosopher. Atlantis existed in what today is the Atlantic Ocean. Same reason, same situation, same law of cause and effect. When people convince themselves there is nothing wrong, everything is okay, they destroy themselves. Mother Nature recycle, because as we said it before, there is a limit for evil, and they touch that limit. So Mother Nature recycle planet Earth, and most of that humanity of Atlantis collapsed with it. They disappear in the middle of earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. And they were, of course, they were suffering the horror of the end of their civilization. So the end of the so-called civilization, because they became a very evil humanity, an egotistic humanity that didn't deserve to be around because they didn't create paradise on earth, which is the highest purpose of life, isn't it? So, allow me to tell you something else. The Bible speaks about Belzebub. Belzebub is a demon. It's a demon that is a horrible demon that lived in Inferno. It was a habitant of hell that came out of Inferno to collect. When people made a pact with the devil, made a pact, with Belzebub, you know, they were given a very comfortable life here on earth. And when the time expired and people didn't pay, didn't want to die physically to go to inferno to pay with their own soul, Belzebub appeared physically. And Belzebub, that horrible beast, that ego, egotistic monster, a combination of a gorilla, of a huge gorilla, and with a gigantic reptilian form, killed that person in a position of power who had made a deal with Satan. And that monster devoured, ate alive that person and took, took it to the other side. Well, this 
horrendous demon, a hierarchy, a hierarchy within the Black Lodge, repented. Do you know why? Because he realized that, you know, Mother Nature is recycling our planet Earth, and this is the end of a cycle and the beginning of a new cycle. So Belzebub repented and faced the chief of the Black Lodge, came back to him saying, I'm not going to be part of the Black Lodge any longer. And the Archangel Samael Unveor, founder of Gnostic Anthropology, with his angels of strength, warrior angels that accompany him, were there facing the chief of the Black Lodge and supporting Belzebub's decision. When Belzebub couldn't be destroyed by the hierarchies of the Black Lodge, protected by the White Lodge, Belzebub then was followed by thousands and thousands of small demons, and they were protected by the White Lodge because they all repented. And now they are waiting for the time to be given human form again on Earth, while they are learning the doctrine of the Cosmic Christ, which is the same doctrine for all prophets, not only Jesus Christ, we said that before. So basically, you see, the end of a cycle represents that. That is good and that is evil. The tree of knowledge is teaching us. So we shouldn't ignore it. But pseudo-esoteric groups, sometimes they don't even know that they are wrong. They have convinced themselves that they know enough without realizing, you know, they, that they are maybe sincerely mistaken individuals. Our mission is to, you know, share this knowledge with them all and to understand that, that after Belzebub repented, the chief of the Black Lodge was imprisoned within the Black Moon, which is near to our physical moon. It's an asteroid called Lilith. And he will be there in prison for a thousand or more, a thousand years or more, because they expect him to repent. Maybe he will never do it, but God is not a dictatorship. God expects that the chief of the Black Lodge, a fallen angel that fell during the time of Sodoma and Gomorrah, the time of the Lemurians, a fallen angel, part of the Adams and the Eve that were angelical beings. Well, this individual, after he was an angel, he fell, but he never repented. He continued developing his perversion after perversion until he became the chief of the Black Lodge. And he had done a lot of harm to humanity. But now I'm telling you that our planet Earth has been rescued back to the Cosmic Christ. So the Black Lodge will try to take control again, but that's impossible. So Mother Nature is recycling our planet Earth, and this is what's happening right now. The future doesn't belong to neither of the authorities of the world today, because they are not practicing the doctrine of the Cosmic Christ the doctrine of enlightenment, to create paradise on earth again. So the time has come to learn to become intelligent rebels instead of rebels against God, rebels without a cause. Most of people are rebels without a cause. We have to learn, instead of learning to become intelligent rebels, when you are an intelligent rebel, you know that we are here with a purpose. The purpose of life is to ascend to transform our psychological lead into our psychological gold, to ascend into masterhood. We know that most of people are not interested in masterhood. One of the reasons is the child who was questioning the grown-up people around them, questioning them about everything. They were in love with knowledge. They were hung hungry and thirsty for knowledge, but they were told to go to play with the other kids. Those children became disenchanted about growing psychologically. Instead of falling in love with knowledge, they fell in love with limited knowledge. 
instead of falling in love with excellence, which is knowledge plus knowledge plus knowledge, which is also Gnosis, Gnostic anthropology. They fell in love with limited knowledge, what you learn in school, high school, maybe universities, and this is it. What a tragedy. What, you know, so many talents wasted in our planet Earth. But we still have some time to change, to repent, to learn to become intelligent rebels, supporting the cause of the divinity, learning to ascend, and to stop being rebels without the cause. Thank you very much for listening. The one thing that comes to mind, the title of this uh, lecture is, Are We All Puppets of the Ego? And what comes to mind is addictions. In Toronto here, we have the Addiction Research Center, and they study addictions. What do they do? They study alcohol addiction. They study drug addiction, mostly. But there are all kinds of addictions, addicted to cigarettes, addicted to pretty well <clears throat> anything that, that you want. But they have no clue, none whatsoever, that ego is involved. And also, one of the things they've found, according to their own publications, is that... Um, Everyone who seems to get over addictions has a crutch, has a dependency, either looks to God or looks to a support group, Alcoholics Anonymous, friends, somebody to support them. It seems that they don't have enough strength to be able to handle an addiction on their own. And so they go through this addiction uh, conquering process, they think. They don't realize the addiction still there, the ego that is still there but they 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 have to have support they have to have strength well many people find that in religion do you have anything to say about this yeah it, essentially you know what's happening is that they are you know these are scientists psychiatrists psychologists who are very much concerned about mental health without realizing that they they continue being three-dimensional we mentioned that before you know, instead of learning to become multidimensional because the mind is not the brain. And they give a lot of pills, you know, to balance the brain activities, ignoring that the ego is ruling the brain from outside of the brain. The ego doesn't live inside of us. The ego is in and out, in and out all the time. It's, it's a monster divided in thousands and thousands of little demons, you know, we can call them entities. They are, there is no spirituality there. God is not there. So the problem is, Samayla Umbeor described that we believe we have only one mind. And in reality, every little eye represents a, another mind. So if we have 10,000 demons or entities as part of our ego, then we have 10,000 little minds divided and subdivided, fighting amongst them all. You know, uh, as we tried to explain it before, one of my eyes would love to go now to have a beer with my friends, you know, and to enjoy the rest of the day relaxing, you know, having a beer, watching television in a, in a bar, you know. And another eye would love, oh, you know, I saw a bicycle on the street, and I would love to get a new bike because the one I have is not good enough anymore. Or what about the motorcycle? Another eye would love to have a motorcycle. Oh, what about a new car? Yes, yes, I need a new car. You know, this car is getting older also. What about the new house? Yeah, this house is too small already, you know. But I need to make more money to buy a better house, you know. What about furniture? Yeah, I hate my furniture already. I hate my neighborhood. I should move to a better neighborhood. So different eyes, different eyes, based on what? Desire desire, desire, because they are all coming from the astral body that we mentioned before, the molecular body, and that molecular body had been infiltrated by the ego, and we created desire after desire after desire. And of course, that makes us slaves of the ego. And our psychologists and psychiatrists don't realize that because they, they've been practicing a division, a strong division between science and religion, they don't believe in the sacred books anymore. They became atheists, very much into materialistic perceptions of reality. 
And of course, science without religion lames. Religion without science is blind, according to Albert Einstein. And this is the mistake that they are committing. And also they are three-dimensional. They don't realize that the mind is a different body. It's a body made of only atomic particles. Believing that the atomic particles live inside of the cellular body, which is not true. It's a body by itself. It's a complete organism by itself, independent from the physical body. They are connected. Yes, it's true. They are connected. But they are not the same. You see? And this is, is ignorance. Psychologists and psychiatrists have been trained the wrong way, in an incomplete manner. And this is why Gnostic anthropology, Gnostic psychology, Gnostic cosmology is bringing into the world, as, as we said, th this is a torch of inspiration, new creative imagination, intuition, which is knowledge without thinking. But to get there, we have to annihilate the ego. When the ego dies, we awaken our consciousness because the ego is subconscious, unconscious, infraconscious. And this is why if the ego is alive within ourselves, that big monster that is ruling our lives, we are getting nowhere. And this is why, you know, you're right regarding what you said, Rick. So one of the things too is the, um, the, the notion of having support. Once you understand the, the doctrine, as you say, all of the knowledge of how, how the ego works, what to do, all of the steps to take, then you realize that you have all of the support that you really need inside of you, your monad, your real being, right? That's correct. This is why, you know, Samaylon Weber recommends to pray a lot of the divinity, to pray and ask for help, ask for help. What should I do now? Please tell me God. And... After we do that, after we practice prayer and prayer and prayer every day, every night, we have to learn to do something higher than praying, which is meditation. What is meditation? It's learning to listen to God's answer to our petitions. You see, and it, it maybe will take some time to get there, but eventually God's answers are connected with what? With cosmic law. The law of cause and effect, you know, if we make a wrong decision, we will have to pay for it. And the entire human race, we are all making wrong decisions because we didn't question God before we made the decision. Wrong thoughts, wrong thinking, wrong emotions will lead us into destruction and self-destruction. And this is why we're suffering. We don't even know the cause of so much pain on earth. And you know, Samael and Veor call us the great orphan. What's the meaning of that, the great orphan, that we don't have a father and a mother? Yes, we have a physical father and a physical mother, maybe, but we don't have a spiritual father, a spiritual mother, or God, the divinity, because we are the ones who walk away from God. We wanted to ignore God, believing that we didn't need God. And this is not only for atheist people, it's also for religious fanatics who convince themselves that God is in their heart, but it is not. When you're a religious fanatic, you're also ruled, controlled by the ego. You see, both are ruled by the ego, atheist and religious fanatics. When we learn to annihilate the ego, we'll be able to connect with God because this is the world, this is the block that we created ourselves between God and us, between the spirit, the divinity, and our mind, which is our soul. The soul is the opposite of the ego. The soul is consciousness. The ego is subconscious, unconscious, infraconscious. And so the idea of a marionette, the little puppet with the strings, the ego is really pulling the strings. And That's correct. The <laughs> ego is ruling, had been ruling planet Earth for thousands of years. You know, all prophets came to teach us to annihilate the ego, but we never listened. Jesus Christ developed a more, a very, very powerful tendency. But you know, so many Christian groups and Catholic, you know, church haven't been teaching clearly that the ego has to be annihilated. You know, and 
this is wrong because this is an incomplete way of perceiving true religion and true Christianity. So when, when someone does something really bad and they make a joke and they say, well, the devil made me do it. Actually, there's truth in that, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But in reality, you know, we, we should learn to defeat the ego yeah. because God didn't give us the ego. God, God is watching us and we created our own mistakes, our own wrong creation and our own Satan. So our mission now is to, it's an accounts payable with God, is to pay the, our debts with good deeds. And the good deeds are the opposite of the ego, learning to become an intelligent rebel, to rebel against our own mistakes, you know, and this is why. And that way we can also reach masterhood, because we have passed a very heavy test, which is the annihilation of our own wrong creation. For that, we need repentance first. We need to accept our mistakes and also we need to dedicate every day of our lives to try to learn to ascend, you know, to get closer to God. But the ego, with the ego inside, there is no way we're going to get closer to the divinity. You've been listening to Are We All Puppets of the Ego? I think the answer to that is yes. My host today was Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Rick, for inviting me again. Thanks to our listeners for your patience and your understanding. We are with you all the way. We are trying to pay our debts with the divinity by sharing this divine knowledge.